somebody in their dreams and the bed partner ends up being injured. That's how they come to the, to the hospital. The Parkinson's patients that, end, that end, have had dream and active behavior and have it now, when they're flailing around in their dreams, their movements are fluid. They no longer have the Parkinson's rigidity when their body is under control of their mind. That's fact. Look it up. Paradoxical kinesis. And when I read that, I just had to have that in the book. Even if that's the only example that we'll ever find, doesn't it just change the way you think about yourself, about your brain, about the dreaming mind? Can dreams be interpreted? So this is this is the the last slide. You know, we'll take we'll take a bunch of questions, but I want to give this one a little bit of time again. So when we started this conversation, I showed you this slide, right? Because I'm, I'm coming at it from this perspective. The frontal lobe here is the activity dampen. And the way the way you should think about your brain is not, you know, off and on. It's not a switch. It's always on. It's just a matter of what's dominant. Is it 51, 52% executive network that's active? Or is it 51, 52% imagination network? The biggest example of that is dreaming that's active. You're always toggling. When your mind wandering, it's more, it's, you know, it's almost 50-50. When you're daydreaming, if I went to Hawaii, if I went to London, this would happen. Maybe it's 51-49. When you're dreaming, it's like 53 imagination network, 47 executive network. So think of your brain as a modulation, a thermostat, not on off, where it's creativity lives this spot. Now it doesn't work like that. And how do I know that? Mm -hmm. The people uh, thinking about book cover designs and poetry, and they put them in these fancy scanners, and we look at the studies for that, but the measurement is to be creative, you have to toggle and let the imagination network become slightly dominant, to come up with the ideas, to be imaginative, to have divergent thinking. And then you have to have the executive network return with the frontal lobes coming back and say, is that a good idea? Or is that just a wild idea? It has to be applicable, it has to be put to use. So your life, whether you like it or not, in a day, you're going from executive network during when you're awake, being mostly dominant, to imagination network being dominant while you're dreaming, right? That's a 24-hour cycle that you, you go into in extremes. In the middle of your day, you're toggling closer to a balance with some, between imagination and executive network. When there isn't a task that's on outward, then what your brain does, it doesn't rev down. Just like when you fall asleep, you don't rev down. When the task outward is controlled, where you're driving and it's, it's a road you're familiar with, or you're shaving, or you're riding a bike, the imagination network comes back up. You're always toggling between imagination network and executive network. So when you talk about interpreting dreams, that neuroscientific explanation is for a point. When you are dreaming, let me just give you a tiny bit of example here. These little dots are the neuronal bodies. Mm. They're like the, if, if neurons are like jellyfish, they're like the, the, the circular meaty part. The tentacles all reach down this way to your brain stem, not to your body. The surface of your brain is where a lot of the magic happens. So that's why we stimulate the brain to understand it. It's not, there's, there's a three-dimensional component to your brain. It's not just like flan or cake and homage and it's like a liver all the way through. The neurons sit on the canopy. They send in branches down the middle to your legs and arms. But there's another canopy. And that's, see that? And that's the limbic emotional system. So when you are dreaming, this part here, the frontal lobes, rev down a little bit, and this part is liberated so much that you couldn't get there if you were awake and had some terrible or wonderful emotional experience, it would not get to the top speed that the emotional system here, the limbic system they call it, can do in dreaming. So when you interpret dreams, keep that in mind, there's, I think there's five ways to look at them. First is the dream that requires no deciphering. You're nervous about a presentation, you have a dream, you show up naked to a podium or something. Right? That's that you know what that is. We don't have to talk about that. Or, you know, you're at fear of heights and something's scaring you and you're worried about that. Or 
Do you have an exam and you have a dream that you woke up and then you were late? That the waking anxiety, waking brain anxiety fits the dreamy brain anxiety. That one requires no interpretation. Mm -hmm. Then there's genre dreams, where towards the end of life, some of my cancer patients, they're struggling with their journey. They'll have expansive dreams about reconciliation and such. Those dreams are your waking life is so intense that your dream life is a, is a predictable companion to those experiences and emotions. That happens uh, also in pregnancy. Common dreams about rolling over and the kids in the bed with you. Moms who are pregnant, they'll report that. So those, so there's a dream that doesn't need deciphering. There's the sure genre dreams that are clear. There's also the universal dreams, nightmares and erotic dreams which happen in children and preteens, and to me, our, our cognitive development, just like we learn to walk and talk, I think nightmares and erotic dreams develop the human mind so it can be mature. Um, then there's junk dreams, like it's just static. We don't hold waking life to a standard um, where everything has to be smart, every idea has to be clever. And so those, that fourth category, so you're gonna have, you know, dreams, is gonna, they're gonna let off solar flares that are useless. So which ones to go after? Which ones to think about the next day? Because your dreaming brain is in a hyper-emotional state, can be in a hyper-emotional state. The ones to go after, and also visual, but hyper emotional the ones you have a, a lingering, long emotional residue with, to me, those are the ones to reflect upon. Those are the ones to think about the next day, because they may offer you an insight